The new project is a 19th century half leather library binding. This binding is designed to be durable. The leather on the spine is glued to the spine so it's a tight back binding. The leather in the joints isn't paired so there's a wide French groove to allow the boards to open. So this is a perfect binding to start learning how to use leather. Because of the tight back, this book doesn't open flat. So it's not really a stationary binding. It's not good for a notebook. So I'm going to bind up a book. Now this guy, Stopan, has reformatted the classic book, Book Binding in the Care of Books by Cockrell, uh, so that it can be bound up. So I've bought this from his Etsy store and I'll put a link to it on the description of this video. So if you want to use the same text as me, it's available. I've printed it out on ADGSM copy paper, so it's fairly lightweight paper. So I'm going to start by making the end papers. So I'm going to use a cloth hinged end paper that's very similar to the standard springback binding end paper that I use, except I'm not going to do the second uh, reinforcing cloth on the outside. This end paper is specifically recommended by Johnson for library bindings. It's his example number 10 in his book. This style of binding is described in all the classic textbooks. However, for this project, I'm going to rely on three specific textbooks. I'm going to rely on Arthur Johnson's The Thames and Hudson Manual of Bookbinding, uh, William Matthews' Bookbinding, and Advanced Bookbinding by J.K. K -A -Y. There are features that I like and don't like from all three of these books. And I'll try and point these out as I go along. For example, uh, this end paper is specifically uh, called out by Johnson as good for this binding. However, uh, Kay recommends using a zigzag end paper. And uh, Matthews, I seem to remember, recommends a made end paper. Now, there's no absolute hard rule on these details, but they're the ones that, that I've decided that I like and want to use in this specific design. Now I'm talking away about stuff that's not related to what's happening on the video at the moment, but this, this step I've done a number of times in videos, and I'm trying to learn how to use the little pop-up information thing on YouTube. So what I'll do is try and pop up a little eye up in the top right hand corner that links to the video that gives the specific details on how to do this end paper, for instance. But I will try and, and describe uh, details as I go, but uh, this end paper design is fairly straightforward and I'd rather tell you about my design decisions for this book uh, rather than describing this end paper for the third or fourth time. The coloured paper I'm using here is one of my paste papers. It's a, a simple pulled paste paper. One thing that's a little bit different about it is I normally brush uh, from head to tail when I do my pulled papers and this one I brushed horizontally to sort of stretch out the, the, um, the pull lines in the paste. I think it worked pretty good. I, I, I quite liked it. I'm especially pleased with the colour. You may have noticed that I'm fighting a little bit with the adhesive. Now, I always or nearly always use mix when making made end papers. Uh, straight paste introduces too much moisture and straight PVA uh, is just a, a bit dangerous. You uh, don't have any time to make any adjustments. So I like mix. 
But I also recently changed my PVA. So I've used PVA, EVA supplied by the Queensland Bookbinders Guild. And recently I started using a, a uh, formulation of EVA called Evasol, which I believe was developed by the CSIRO in Australia and is supposed to have uh, super duper ar archival qualities. As a EVA, it's working really well. Um, however, the mix is a bit funny. Uh, I'll have to work that out. So if anyone's got any experience using Evasol uh, in mix, uh, please let me know. It does say on the label for uh, Evasol that it's uh, fine to mix with uh, starch adhesives and methyl cellulose. So I'm not quite sure what I've, um, what I've done to make it go a little bit lumpy. I, I've tried working the lumps out. It's almost sort of uh, curdled. Anyway, it, it did work though. Now I should say something about this text block. Stopan is a bookbinder from Bulgaria. He has a really interesting YouTube channel. He does some amazing work. And he came up with this great idea to reformat some of these classic textbooks that are in the public domain so that they can be printed out and bound up. So I've, I've uh, bought a couple of these to use in videos. And this is the first one I'll use. Uh, and it's all formatted, ready to go. However, there's a few quirks about it. He's done eight sheet sections, and I would have preferred maybe five sheet sections. And it's also formatted to flip on the long edge, and I'm used to flipping on the short edge, so I end up wasting a few sheets by printing it out incorrectly. So the, the sections are quite thick, but it is a good exercise in that uh, as bookbinders, we don't always get exactly what we want, and we have to adapt. So this is an example of adapting. So I've folded them, all the sections, made sure that they've um, that uh, the pages are in the right order, and I've put them in the press. Uh, I'd put the end papers in the press, so I've taken. I only put them in the press for an hour or two, and then I hung them up overnight. And I put the text block in the press overnight as well to flatten it out. That's especially important because of the thick thickness of the sections. So I'm trimming up the end papers, and because they're a bit curly. I'm going to put them back into the press uh, because I don't need them right now. So I'll put them into the press to uh, flatten out the curliness a bit. Uh, so when I go to sew them onto the text block, uh, they'll be easier to handle. So this is the next day I've had the text block in the press overnight. And the first thing I'm going to do is make sure that the sections are in the correct order. So I'm going to sew on three tapes. I'm going to put the kettle stitch 12 millimeters from the head, and because the tail's a little bit uneven, I'll take that in 15 millimeters. So I've got a little bit more space for trimming. Then I'll space the tapes evenly between the kettle stitches, and then once I have those marks, I'll use the tapes to mark the sewing holes a fraction on uh, either side of the tapes. And because this isn't a blank notebook anymore and I need to keep the sections in order, I'll put a diagonal line across the spine to make sure, or to reassure myself that I'm keeping the sections in the correct order. I'll make one of my usual uh, punching tools or templates.
And because this is a tight back binding and the leather is going to be adhered to the back of the book, um, we're going to need to make the back of the book quite smooth. So I want the kettle stitches to sink into the back of the book. So I'm going to cut in the um, kettle stitch locations. I'm not going to cut through to the center fold. And because they're eight sheet sections, uh, that's quite easy to not do. Something I should have mentioned at the start is another characteristic of a library binding is that it uses split board attachment. So the, the tapes are going to get uh, glued down to the outer waste sheet and that's going to get inserted into the split boards. That's one of the characteristics that make this a very strong, durable binding. I put an X on the waste sheet of the end papers so that I could keep track of uh, the outer waste sheet, I guess. The um, pulled pattern is directional, so it, it sort of goes down, and I want that to match uh, front and back of the book. So I need to keep track of the uh, outside and the front and back end papers. And that's important when I punch the holes in the end papers as well. So I was double checking that I was uh, punching from the head. Matthews does recommend overcasting the first and last sections for strength. Now I have done this uh, just because Matthews said to, and uh, so I have done it in the past to give it a go. In general, I don't like overcasting the first and last sections or guarding the first and last sections, whether it be with paper or cloth, uh, which was often recommended for additional strength because I've seen too many books a hundred or so years old where the paper has become very fragile at the edge of the guard. Now, I was just indicating that I'm using 18.3 thread here because, because the sections are quite thick. I need a thicker thread to get the 20 to 30% swell that I'm after. So anyway, going back to overcasting the first and last sections, uh, it is often recommended in the classic texts. Uh, but, um, I mean, just last week I was looking at a binding at the State Library of New South Wales and it, the first and last sections had been guarded for strength and just as I described the paper had become extremely brittle and uh, at the edge of that guard. So uh, while it is recommended in these texts it's something that uh, I don't generally do unless I'm trying to follow one of these te texts exa exactly. Because of the cloth joint, I was having a few problems finding the holes in the end papers to sew them on. And I kept putting my head in front of the camera, so I have cut a lot of this out because you don't need to see the back of my head. Uh, but uh, you, you know the details. I'm sewing it around the tapes for the end papers to get a continuous uh, line of thread on the inside, which also 
uh, strength strengthens the binding or stops the end papers from slipping on the tapes. But I only do that for the end papers and not for the sections. So I've decided to show just about all the details in these projects, even if they're things that I've covered in the past a number of times. I just think it may be useful to some people. Uh, I will speed up the repetitive stuff like the sewing and some of the extremely repetitive stuff like the sewing. I may cut a little bit of that out. But uh, if I'm not going to talk for a while, I might sneak in a bit of music. So if the music starts, then you know that uh, it's something that you may have seen in the past and may decide to skip ahead. Um, so if the music starts, there's probably one or two minutes uh, where I'm not going to say anything. Of course, I'm showing off by using a sewing frame. Not everyone's got a sewing frame. Uh, if you don't have a sewing frame, you don't need it for sewing on tapes. It does make it a bit easier and faster. The split boards won't be needed for a while, but now seems a good time to make them. Uh, I'm going to use mix, though mix uh, or P straight PVA, EVA would be fine as well. Uh, I'll glue about two-thirds of the width of the board. The boards are oversized and they'll get trimmed down later. I'm using one millimeter board for the inside board and two millimeter board for the outside board. I'm applying adhesive to the thinner material, um, though with these boards the chances are of warping is fairly low. Just 
going to check the swell. Typically you want 20 to 30 percent swell at the spine and in this case uh, I've got 25% uh, swell so I don't need to knock any of the swell out that's pretty much uh, exactly what I want. Now I have a bad habit of forgetting to hit the record button. I did it so many times that the first time I started to record the library binding uh, that I had to start again. Now I forgot to hit the record button when I pasted down the first and last sections and the end paper on the current project. But I did record it the first time I started this project. So you'll notice that the end papers have gone green for this step. Um, but uh, it's exactly the same. Uh, except uh, I think the new project with the uh, stop and text is a, a better project anyway. So it was a win-win. Now I'm going to mark the trim line for the fore edge. Uh, Stopan has left a very generous margin at the fore edge. I'd sort of wished he'd moved the text a bit towards the fore edge, but it is what it is. Now I'm going to glue the spine, but not the tapes. I'm going to leave the tapes uh, unglued, and then I'm going to trim the fore edge. Now my guillotine blade is blunt so I'm going to do it in the plow but normally you, for a library binding you um, a trade binder would have done it in a guillotine. You're probably thinking that I used an awful lot of tape and that's true I normally use a lot less tape but when you're videoing projects uh, you like to make it as easy as possible on yourself and I wanted uh, plenty of tape to put in the sewing key and to keep the crossbar nice and high and so I just used a bit extra tape because I was videoing but normally I try and be frugal with my materials uh, such as tape Now I recently published the video on using the plow, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on how to use a plow. Uh, hopefully I'll work out how to put that little eye up in the right hand corner to link to that video if you want to know about uh, using a plow. But it's pretty straightforward. I'll go through until I hit the back end paper. Now I'm going to sprinkle the edges uh, with uh, a blue um, acrylic. So I'm watering, it's a high flow acrylic that I've watered down 50-50 with uh, deionized water. Now every time I talk to someone about edge sprinkling and say that I like to use a, a brush with a mesh, uh, I'm always told that it's better to use a toothbrush. So for all the people that love to use a toothbrush, here we go. Now I did practice this trying to drag the bristles over the edge of a piece of uh, grey board, over the edge of a knife. Uh, I tried doing it with uh, gloves on and none of these really worked very well. I found to get a nice even pattern I really just had to use my fingers uh, which meant that I had blue fingers for a few days. 
Now I admit the toothbrush works really well. I never said it didn't. Um, I just prefer using my brush with a mesh. However, I did find one of the obstacles to using a toothbrush was finding a toothbrush. They all now have soft bits of plastic or really jagged uh, profiles that don't flick very well. So just finding a standard hard bristle toothbrush is now an obstacle uh, to using this method. So before I trim the head and tail, I'll round the book. Uh, nothing really special about this process. Uh, use the trick of um, moistening your fingers and putting your thumb into the foredge and pulling it as you hammer down in a sort of circular motion to, towards the spine. Uh, do this um, back and forth between sides until you get the nice round that you want. Now I'm going to mark the shoulders uh, at this point. Now the shoulders should be the same depth as the board, so I just measured the uh, split board, um, which I guess is in the press if we're really following this. Um, it's three millimeters, so there's lots of ways you can um, measure that three millimeters. I'm just going to use a ruler. Now I'm going to mark the trim lines as well, and then go trim those. Uh, with the plow, I'm just going to make sure that uh, it's square. And again, I'm not going to go into too much detail um, on how to use the plow. So we'll finish up the video with the edge sprinkling and next week we'll pick up uh, with the backing of the book. So it will be a three part project. So the next part will be from the backing, um, making the tab that goes into the split boards, um, attaching the split boards and uh, marking up the covers. And then in the final video, we'll uh, cover the book in leather and cloth and paste down the end papers. So if you want to be notified about the 
future videos, please hit the subscribe button. So if you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button. Not only does that uh, give me encouragement, but it also lets YouTube know that uh, people like this video and it'll recommend it to people interested in bookbinding. So next week we'll pick up on the backing of the book, then we'll line the spine, etc. So until next week, thanks for watching.